So big thank you to the organizers for inviting us to talk um, and putting us first, isn't that lovely? Um, so as Christina said, this is kind of a double act. It's me and my postdoc, Nick, who's gonna be talking in a minute. Basically, I'm gonna do a sort of quick overview introduction to what ANSWER does. And then Nick's gonna give you some exciting current results. Um, so I'm gonna just kick off by talking about what ANSWER is. So it's, it's called ANSWER because it stands for something which I'll show you in a minute, but it's also the answer to all your problems. Um, and what it does basically is says whether the structure that you have, and this could be an NMR structure or it could be a structure derived from other methods, uh, matches the experimental data, in particular the chemical shifts and solutions. So it's doing a validation. So validation is basically saying, is my structure correct? Um, why would we ever want to do that? Um, basically because it's actually very hard to tell if an NMR structure is correct or not. How do you know if your structure is correct? If you go to PDB and you look up an NMR structure on PDB, you will see a, a, a graphic like this, which basically tells you something about how good the structure is. It gives clash score, that is, do the atoms bump into each other, Ramachandran outliers, side chain outliers. So this is a measure of geometrical quality, basically. It tells you whether the structure looks like a nice protein or not. That's obviously useful, but it doesn't tell you if it's correct. Uh, so how do you tell if it's correct? How do I move my slides on? Um, if you want to tell if your structure is correct, you have to basically compare your structure to the input data. And the obvious input data to compare it to is NOEs. So you look at NOE violations. Does my structure have NOE violations? Um, my feeling is, and, and this is not just me, lots of people said this, that NOE violations are really not a good way to tell if your structure is correct or not. And that's because the NOE list that you use to generate your structure is derived from the NOSI spectra, but it took a long way to get there. You iterate, you delete NOEs you don't like, you have to work out distance relationships and so on. Uh, the, the NOE list is actually quite a long way from the input data. So it's actually not really a good test of whether your structure is good or not. You could look at something much simpler like the number of NOE restraints. Uh, that's not really comparing to input data and it's pretty crude. Um, the measure that most people use to say, are my structures nice, is the RMSD. That is the root mean squared distance between all the structures in your ensemble. Uh, and that is very explicitly a measure of precision, not a measure of accuracy. If anyone wants to know the difference between precision and accuracy, I can tell you but precision and accuracy are definitely not the same thing, and what we want is accuracy, not precision. So none of those is really a good way of telling if your structure is good. And what we wanted was a method um, that compared, as far as we could get, the output data, that is the structure, to the input data, your NMR data. Um, we didn't want to compare it to actual spectra, because again, that's quite messy and difficult. So what we did is we used chemical shifts. So basically what ANSWER does is it compares the input chemical shifts, your assignments, to the output structures and uses that to tell if the structure is good or not. So, how does ANSWER work? We don't use NOE restraints at all, so there's no NOEs involved in this. It's basically using chemical shifts. So what you do is you take your backbone chemical shift measurements, so these six uh, shifts here, and calculate what is essentially the random coil index, uh, which David Wishart uh, published quite a long time ago. And here's an example of the random coil index, RCI where you've got your sequence on the bottom, and then essentially this is a flexibility score up the side, so there are some rigid bits which are secondary structure, there are some less rigid bits which are basically loops and the termini of the protein. So that's how RCI works. And what we do, that, do, do with that is we compare that RCI result, that is this basically experimental data, um, to a measure of rigidity determined from the structure, um, this is using a graph theoretical method, which we can talk about if anybody really wants afterwards, but it's basically taking the structure, look at all the distances, including all the hydrogen bonds and, and um, hydrophobic contacts in the structure, and calculating what the rigidity of that structure is, and you get a graph that looks like that, so it looks something like the RCI data. Um, and then what we do is we compare the RCI score, which is the blue one, to the rigidity score from the structure, which is the orange one, and say how similar are those two graphs? And that's our measure of, is this a good structure? Um, we played around with various ways of comparing them and we actually used two different kinds of comparisons. 
Uh, one is the RMSD, not to be confused with the RMSD I just talked about. The RMSD is for each residue, how different is this point from that point? So it's just the average distance between the points. And the correlation is are the peaks and the troughs in the same place? So you can see for this data set, the RMSD is rubbish because they're nowhere near each other. Actually, the correlation is quite good because the peaks and the troughs are in the same place. They're just displaced. Um, we measure most, both of those. We express them actually as a percentile ranked order um, out of 100. So what, what I'm showing here is one group of NMR structures. Um, so it's four different structures. Obviously, it's the same chemical shift data. So the blue data, which is the RCI data, is the same for all of them because that's the experimental NMR data. And I'm comparing here the calculated rigidity of the structure calculated for four different structures. And you can see, for example, this structure here, um, both the, uh, the correlation score is not very good because the peaks and troughs are in the different places, and the RMSD score is not very good. So that structure is not very good at all. This one, by contrast, has both measures really very good. So this one's in the top right. That is, it is a good structure. So that's the most accurate structure. That would be the worst structure. Um, and we report those two measures as different, fairly independent measures of how good the structure is. Um, when, to make it easier, we can just add them together to get an overall answer score, which is a number out of 200. Uh, this method was published at the end of last year in HCOMS, and there's the data. We, I guess this is all going to be made available afterwards. There is a website which lists the uh, accuracy of all the NMR structures in the PDB that have good enough chemical shift data to do it with. Um, you can download the program and do it yourself. And if, you've, if you're interested in trying that, we'd love to talk to you and show you how to do it. Um, and we've recently published another paper looking at all the PDB structures, uh, NMR structures in the PDB, uh, which is now uh, available from Structure or from BioArchive. And I just want to spend a few minutes showing you three results uh, from that, from those published papers, quite briefly because it is published. The first thing we did, or one of the first things we did, was compare where they exist, NMR structures to crystal structures of the same protein, to say, how do NMR structures compare to crystal structures? This was a curated set of structures, so they're actually quite you know, nicely sorted. So basically, this, this top panel here is showing the correlation score. That is basically to say, are the peaks and troughs in the same place? That is, is the secondary structure correct? And they are, they're both very similar. So basically, NMR and crystal structures are very similar in terms of how well they calculate the overall uh, structure of the protein. Uh, where they differ is the bottom one, uh, which is the RMSD score, where basically these are the NMR structures, RMSD of about 50. These are the crystal structures, RMSD of about 90. Crystal structures are much better than NMR structures in terms of the kind of overall rigidity of the structure. So that is, NMR structures are much too floppy. That's very clear from all the analyses we've done. Actually, crystal structures are slightly too rigid. Not a surprise, because the question we're asking is, does the crystal structure match the NMR solution data? And you might well expect that the crystal structure would be too rigid compared to the NMR solution data. Uh, but very clearly, NMR structures are too floppy. Um, crystal structures are slightly too rigid. Here's an example. So you can see, as, as you're used to seeing, I'm sure, that if you compare the NMR structure to the crystal structure, NMR structure, secondary structures overlay very well. There are some differences in the loops. Um, and as an NMR person, you would probably say, okay, that's a loop. It's, it's not well defined, doesn't matter. It does matter. Those loops genuinely are defined in solution and NMR genu genuinely does a bad job of saying what they look like. Um, and Nick will talk more about that in his talk. Okay, um, same thing when you look at NMR ensembles, and we're not gonna talk much about NMR ensembles, but it's a fascinating problem. So here's an NMR ensemble. Again, secondary structure, very well defined loops all over the place. Is that variability in the loops real, or is it basically a problem in the NMR structure? And I'm sure you can guess the answer. The problem is the NMR structures. Those loops actually are defined. They do have a structure. It's just that NMR currently is not able to say what they look like. So there is a problem with NMR structures, folks. Um, second one, are we getting any better at determining NMR structures? So they're not very good. Are they getting better? Um, so, for example, what we did is we took answer scores from all the structures and did them by year, and you can see the score went up, 
till about 2005, and then it hasn't really improved since then. So NMR structures did get better up till 2005, and that more or less corresponds to Talos and Explore NIH and ARIA and water refinement, all those things happening in these years just before then. And since then, nothing much has happened. NMR structures really haven't got any better. Um, compare that to crystal structures, which have. Um, one reason why NMR structures might have got better is because field strengths have got better. Higher field strength, more sensitivity, more NOEs, structures should be better, and they are. So the structures have got better as the field strength has got better. That's not enough to explain this or this rise. Um, so again, basically, NMR structures have pretty much stagnated since 2005, and I would argue that's because we've not had any way of measuring them and therefore working out how to make them better, and we, we now do. Um, okay, third one I just wanted to say, if you look at the NMR structures within an ensemble, so typically when you submit a structure to PDB, you, you submit an ensemble of 20 structures. Um, how do you know which 20 to pick? How do you know which is the best one of those 20? Um, so the, the one I've picked here is actually from David Neuhaus, and I'm sure he won't mind me showing him this. So this is not because it's bad or good, it's a completely random structure, basically. Um, it's actually quite a nice looking structure, apart from that it's got quite disordered termini, but the, the structure bit is quite nicely defined. It's got small RMSD, looks a nice structure, few NOE violations. Um, when you run ANSWER on it, ANSWER says that, yes, the correlation score is good, the secondary structure is nice, but the RMSD is rubbish, so it's far too floppy, basically, and I'm not talking about the termini, I'm talking about this bit here. Um, and very interestingly, if you go to PDB, and for this one, as for many PDB structures, the best structure in the ensemble is number one in the ensemble. Is number one at the top? No, it's somewhere in the middle. This is actually the lowest energy structure, so can you work out which is the best structure by looking at the energy? No, not really. Um, the number one is not at all the best as far as we can see. Um, so there are definitely problems with NMR ensembles as well, which we are addressing. Um, so, conclusion so far, NMR structures are much too floppy. Um, they haven't got much better in the last uh, 15 years. And there are some fairly simple things that we can do to improve them. And I shall now hand over to Nick. So I, I, I think the best thing to do, we can take questions at the end, but save them for, for after Nick's done his talk, because I think things will be much clearer by that point. Thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak today. Um, thanks, Mike, for the intro. OK, so I'm going to continue to talk about two things. So firstly, how you can use ANSWER to help solve your NMR structure. And I also want to get the conversation started on the future of NMR structure determination. So towards the end of my PhD, this is what the structure calculation landscape looked like, with NMR very much dead and buried. Um, but of course, in 2021, a new player has entered the field and has already made quite a big splash. So I'm looking forward to talking about AlphaFold and, and how it's going to mess everything up for us. OK, so how can you use ANSWER to help solve a structure? So we've been doing just that over the past six months. Uh, we've been trying to solve the structure of a protein called SH2B1. Uh, this, is, uh, this, this protein regulates insulin, leptin, growth hormone signaling pathways. Uh, the protein-protein interactions involved in that are mediated by the SH2 domain, and this recognizes phosphorylated tyrosines. Um, so there is actually already an X-ray structure of that exact domain, but we are interested in whether the the domain could recognize a phosphorylated tyrosine on its own C-terminus. And this is a, quite a, a floppy region. Sorry, Internet, I realize I'm probably supposed to be uh, in, the, in the camera. Uh, we're interested in this, this floppy region, uh, which probably wouldn't be in an X-ray structure, so we decided to solve an N NMR structure. So how do we do that? Well, we used a very, very standard approach. We used Splier to automatically assign our peaks. We manually checked them, and we used Talus to get our dihedral restraints from backbone chemical shifts, and then fed those into Cyanar and, and got our, an ensemble of 20 models. Um, so here's our output. So in Cyan, we've got the first model from the ensemble, uh, and then we can overlay that with the X-ray structure. And we can see that it you know, overlays quite nicely. The secondary structure overlays much better than the loops, but perhaps that's to be expected from an NMR structure. Perhaps that variation is, is fine. If we have a look at the structure statistics, we can see that we had about 1,800 distance restraints, which worked out about 15 per residue, which is about how many you want. Of those, only five were violated. And we had 184 angle restraints, of which only one was violated. So according to the restraint violations, things are looking fine. No major problems being flagged. In terms of the geometry, we only had about 0.1% uh, 
uh, torsion angles in the disallowed region of the Ramachandran plot. So that's, that's pretty reasonable as well. And then in terms of precision and accuracy, um, we computed the average backbone RSD to the mean structure, as you do. It's got a value of about 0.84, so we've got a reasonably tightly defined ensemble, fine. And then because we've got the X-ray structure, we can just compute the RMSD of the heavy backbone atoms to it to, to get some understanding of the accuracy, uh, and we get a value of 0.175. So, so all of these statistics aren't really, it's probably not the best NMR structure in the world, but, but there's nothing really flagging as a major issue. Uh, so what does Arntz have to say about it? So if you remember, Mike said that we compute two scores, which you can visualize on this kind of 2D figure. So the best scoring structures are in the top right, and the worst scoring structures are in the lower left corner. Uh, which is where all 20 of our models are. So according to answer, our structure is rubbish. Um, so why? Well, let's have a look at the underlying data. So the best scoring model is actually model one in this case. Um, in blue, we've got the flexibility computed from the chemical shifts. In orange, we've got the flexibility that we've computed from the model. And what you see is that we've got some of the peaks in the right place, but the whole model across the board is just completely too flexible. Things get much, much worse if we look at the worst scoring model. You can see that the whole thing is just completely too flexible, and we haven't even really got any of the correct peaks anymore. So answer thinks that we've got, a, we've got a terrible structure. So before we drill into it in any more detail, let's have a look at the X-ray structure, because we've got it. Um, so answer works for X-ray structures, so long as you've got your chemical shifts. Um, so the X-ray structure was published in 2017. It's not, not, not by us. Um, it's got a very nice R3 value. It's got lovely geometry. So according to the PDB, it looks like a good structure. It's a highly accurate X-ray structure. Um, and answer agrees. So we've only got a single chain, so we've just got that one little data point which, uh, in the top, but it's in the top right hand corner. It scores very nicely according to both scores. Uh, and if you have a look at the underlying data, it's easy to see why. Again, the, uh, the flexibility according to the shifts in blue and the flexibility of the structure in orange, it matches the flexibility from shifts very, very much better than any of our NMR models. So answer really likes the X-ray structure, and it really doesn't like our NMR structure. So why? Well, I showed this overlay before, and it looks pretty similar but there are clearly differences in the loops, um, and those differences are likely very important. So let's focus on one particular region, so we could pick this one, it seems quite different. Uh, we do need to be careful though, there are four amino acids which are different in the X-ray structure compared to the NMR structure, and it just so happens that two are in this region. So there could be uh, good reasons for, for, for differences, but for now let's just assume that the X-ray structure is correct, and I think that's a, a reasonable assumption. Um, so let's zoom in on that region, and I, I've picked the wrong color for the hydrogen bond. So in green, we've got the X-ray structure, and what we see is a nice beta sheet, and it's, and it's, you have to take my word for it, it's very nicely hydrogen bonded across that beta sheet. Whereas the NMR structure in cyan, we've got the backbone in roughly the right place, but we don't have any hydrogen bonds at all, which seems very, very unlikely. You know, a protein wants to be as hydrogen bonded as possible. Of course, it can hydrogen bond with solvent, but solvent isn't gonna get into that region to form those hydrogen bonds. So I, 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 I think it's wrong, basically. That said, I haven't really done anything with my NMR structure to encourage the formation of hydrogen bonds yet. I haven't included any hydrogen bond restraints, for example. So one thing you can do to try and increase the amount of hydrogen bonds in your structure is you can go and refine an explicit solvent. I haven't done that yet. So I went away and did that, and I managed to find, and again, you might have to take my word for it, I managed to find a single hydrogen bond, and, and that was it. And I'm not really very surprised. I mean, a refinement explicit solvent is a very short simulation. You're not going to sample much space. You know, you're just basically tidying up the geometry. So if the hydrogen bond isn't almost already there, you're probably not gonna find it. So our structure is not liked by answer because it's missing quite a few hydrogen bonds. And we think this is actually quite a common problem, well it definitely is a common problem here in NMR structures in general. So what I've done here is I've taken 220 NMR structures and I've gone to the PDB and found the matching uh, X-ray structures and I've computed the hydrogen bond correctness of the NMR structure. So that's the percentage of hydrogen bonds in the X-ray structure which appear in the NMR structure. So again, I'm assuming that the X-ray structure is the ground truth, it's, you know, it's, it's correct. And again, I think that's a reasonable assumption most of the time. What we see is that NMR structures with higher hydrogen bond correctness uh, have a higher answer score. So remember, answer score is just the sum of the two scores that answer produces. So, so a higher hydrogen bond correctness is a more, leads to a more accurate structure. We also see that NMR structures with higher hydrogen bond correctness also have more hydrogen bonds per residue. So it's not that they've necessarily got the wrong hydrogen bonds, they're just lacking hydrogen bonds. So this is of a long-winded way of saying that NMR structures need more hydrogen bonds. So this is something that we've known about for, for a long time. Of course, the problem is, is how do you get hydrogen bonds in your structure? You can't just add hydrogen bond restraints without some experimental justification. If you have a look at an X-ray structure, it's rather obvious where the, hopefully, where the, where the hydrogen bonds are, but not, not so much with an NMR structure. Um, so how do you go about doing it? Now this is very much a work in progress, but we're looking at using temperature coefficients to try and find some hydrogen bonds to justifiably include them in our calculation. 
So this is, this is also something that's quite old. Uh, so what you do is you plot the change in your AMI proton chemical shift with temperature, the idea being that if an AMI proton is hydrogen bonded, uh, then its chemical shift won't change very much with temperature. Um, so if you take the gradient of this plot, that's, that's the temperature coefficient. If it's greater than minus 4.1 parts, parts per billion per Kelvin, um, then perhaps the AMI proton is involved in a hydrogen bond. The, these things are much more sensitive to hydrogen bonds between backbone atoms, so an AMI to another backbone atom, probably because if it's uh, hydrogen bonded to a side chain, it's more likely to be dissociated with temperature. Um, and of course, this is one way of finding an AMI proton involved in a hydrogen bond, but you, you don't know the acceptor atom. So you, it's sparse, the data, you know, it doesn't tell you the, the whole picture. So I've been having a go at trying to incorporate temperature coefficients into cyanar calculations. So I start with a, a bog standard cyanar calculation where I feed my peaks and my angles into cyanar and generate 20 models. But of course, there is some randomness involved in this. So every time you do this, you will get a slightly different structure. So perhaps we should do it 20 times or, or enough times. Uh, and then have a look at the hydrogen bonds we happen to find. And then we can cross-reference those with our temperature coefficients and see if they, if they occur frequently in the ensemble, then perhaps we're justified in including them as a hydrogen bond restraint. And the idea is, you know, you find some hydrogen bonds, include them as restraints, which help you find the others. And you, you do that until you converge uh, on a set of hydrogen bonds. I don't think this is the best way of doing it, but it's sort of a, a proof of principle. So on the right here, on the left here, I have the output I showed you before. So this was our best scoring model from our normal cyanide calculation before. Everything looks way too floppy. After three iterations of adding hydrogen bonds, I think I added about 19, we get some output that looks like this. So it's not, it's not amazing, um, but you can see there are some regions, uh, can use my mouse, there are some regions which are now starting to become rigidified and in a way that agrees with the flexibility predicted by chemical shifts. Um, and the whole thing has become more, more rigid. That said, there are definitely regions there which are still too floppy, probably because I haven't incorporated in any hydrogen bonds in, in that region. So we're definitely missing something. So what are we missing? Well, something we're, something we're definitely missing is important hydrogen bonds involving side chains. So if you have a look at the X-ray structure, there are actually a number of hydrogen bonds between serine side chains and, and backbone amide protons. Um, there's, a, there's a serine here which is hydrogen bonded to two backbone amides. Whereas if you have a look at our NMR uh, calculations, and I think you need to do the um, you can see that we're getting the backbone in roughly the right place, and that's probably because the NOEs are getting us there, but we haven't found any of the, any hydro, any of the correct hydrogen bonds there. In fact, what we found, and, and it's going to be hard to see, it, uh, so sorry about that, um, but what we found is some very implausible hydrogen bonds. We found two hydrogen bonds between the backbone atom and the side chain of the same residue, which just doesn't seem very likely. Now, you could say, well, loops are dynamic, and perhaps this is representative of something, but really, with an NMR structure, we're trying to find a single ground state structure. Uh, and I'd argue that the X-ray structure is a much better representation of the ground state than this, this, this loop we happen to have found. If I did a simulation with the X-ray structure, yeah, maybe the hydrogen bonds change a bit, maybe they, they flicker on or off, maybe we see some dynamics, um, but you know, it might revisit that ground structure, uh, that ground state. Whereas the NMR, the, the NMR um, loop there, if I started a simulation with it, you know, those hydrogen bonds which are got, have got to be wrong are, are quite strong and are probably going to persist for quite some time, and I reckon we're just going to be sampling nonsense. Um, that said, how do you get these hydrogen bonds into your NMR structure calculation? It's very hard to see them experimentally. It's very hard to, you know, to find them computationally and, and perhaps believe them. Um, so I wondered, you know, how much difference would they really make um, if I could find uh, some justification for including them? So what I did is I took my NMR structure and I just cheated. I had a look at the X-ray structure and said, yeah, I'll take that, I'll take that hydrogen bond, I'll take that one, and, and included them as restraints just to see what would happen. Um, so I took 36 X-ray, uh, 36 hydrogen bonds this way and included them as restraints. Um, I also went on to refine the structures in, in, in explicit solvent, and this is some output that we got. So again, in blue, the flexibility according to the shifts, in orange, the flexibility of the model. And you can see that the flexibility of the model is in very much better agreement with the shifts than anything we've seen before. So of course, we have very, very much improved answer scores. We also have improved RMSD to the X-ray structure, but okay, that's inevitable because I've taken information from the X-ray structure and used it to solve the structure, but we also see improved back calculation of chemical shifts. So it's, it's not just answer which is saying these structures with these, these hydrogen bonds in loops uh, are, are more accurate. So to summarize the first part, thanks. Um, so answer can spot issues that restraint violations and geometrical validation can't. Remember the, my first initial calculation, everything looked fine. Um, many NMR structures lack hydrogen bonds, particularly in the loop regions, and adding them will increase the accuracy of your structure. One way you could do this is to, to consider using temperature coefficients, um, but you, you're, you're not going to get all the hydrogen bonds that way, and you're definitely going to miss uh, hydrogen bonds involving side chains. Okay, so uh, let's go on to talk about this thing. 
So AlphaFold, one place you can find very nice structures with hydrogen bonds between side chains uh, is in uh, is predicted structures from the new fancy AI. So I went away and took our, our sequence and predicted the structure with AlphaFold and RosettaFold, uh, and we can see something that, that looks really rather nice when compared um, against the X-ray structure. So am I suggesting that you go away and predict a structure to find some hydrogen bonds to then including them to then include them as restraints in your NMR structure calculation? That probably isn't a good idea. Um, in fact, going forward, it probably makes sense to start with predicting your structure from AI, right? You know, because these things are supposedly really very good. But of course, in some sense, validation is more important than ever because we need to know just how good they are. So I think it makes sense to predict your structure first and then validate it with experimental data. And if it's accurate, great, you're done. You've, you've solved your structure in an afternoon. If it's not accurate, then of course you can use that experiment data to refine, refine that model uh, until it is consistent. That said, I don't think this is what we're gonna do actually. We're probably, there will almost certainly be AIs where you feed in your sequence and feed in your experimental data at the same time and it can generate it, validate it, and, and do everything. Um, but I think it's an important question to consider, you know, how accurate are these predicted structures? So this is something I was thinking about in December. So in December, the results of the latest CASP competition were released. So um, CASP is, I'm sure you know, is the, the competition for predicting structure from sequence. And this is where AlphaFold made its, made its big splash. Um, so at the time, there were two targets used, uh, and two NMR structures that were used as targets which had been published in the PDB. So I went away and validated them using answer and then validated all the predictions. So in orange, um, we've got the answer scores for the NMR targets, and in blue, we've got the answer scores for the AlphaFold predictions, and then gray are all the other predicted structures. So, so what we can see for the the first target, the best structure um, is the NMR structure, is the experimental structure as you, you, as you would expect, uh, with the alpha fold structure coming in a distant second and then all the others. Whereas for this other one, um, the NMR target, if you can't see it, it's nestled right in the middle of all the, uh, of all the predictions in gray. So it really isn't the most accurate structure according to answer, and the most accurate structure is the alpha fold structure. Now I couldn't prove this in December, um, and I only had an N of two. Uh, I had one example where the prediction was better than the NMR and, and vice versa. But it's since been revealed that actually that, that, that target is inaccurate. And the group has now gone away and resolved it. And it looks very much more like the alpha fold structure. So it was pretty cool to have spotted that um, in December. Um, you know, it only takes a minute to run answer. Um, but I didn't publish it. That's a, that's a shame. OK, so predicting structures can be more accurate than NMR structures. But again, I've only got an N of two. More recently, of course, deep, deep, deep mind. Have, uh, have published predictions for all of human protein structures, so all 24,000. Um, so I took these and matched these to PDB structures from the, uh, from the PDB. I ended up with nearly 1,500. Um, and I validated the alpha fold predictions and the NMR ensembles. So in the top right, I've taken, uh, it's, I, I've plotted the difference in answer score between the alpha fold models and the NMR structures from the BDB. But of course, an NMR structure in the PDB is an ensemble, so I've, I've validated all the models and then plotted the average. Uh, and what we can see is that the alpha models are slightly more accurate than the NMR ensembles according to answer. However, if we go into the ensemble and pick out the best scoring model, then that difference uh, somewhat disappears. So the best scoring models from each NMR ensemble are similarly accurate uh, to the alpha fold models. The mean is, is zero. Um, the mean difference is zero. Um, of course, the difference is, is that your NMR structure is going to take you many months or many years to solve, whereas an alpha fold structure takes 10 minutes. So there's clearly a difference. It's not all doom and gloom, though. Of the 1,500 structures, there were 52 instances where the NMR structure was considerably more accurate than alpha fold. And there were two reasons for this normally. The first is that the alpha fold model was missing uh, some secondary structure. So on the right hand side here, I've got an NMR structure and the answer score, the answer output above it. And we can see that the, I can use my mouse, I guess. Um, you can see that there's a Oh, no. Uh, oh, never mind. Anyway, you can see there's a, there's a little beta sheet region there on, on the green protein, whereas the alpha fold model has missed it, and as a result, it's become too floppy. The other thing that I spotted is that alpha fold sometimes has the incorrect secondary structure. So in green here, we've got our NMR structure, and it's basically alpha helix with a little break in it so it can move around. And the, that flexibility is indicated in both the, the flexibility according to chemical shifts and our computed flexibility from the model, whereas the alpha fold model is just one big helix. So I don't know why that would be, but it could be that because alpha fold was trained on x-ray structures that maybe, you know, the x-ray structure would show just one big helix, uh, but in solution it, it will unwind slightly, but I need, I need to look into that more. On the flip side, there were 451 instances where the alpha fold structures were, were much more accurate than NMR. 
And, and, and the, the predominant reason for this uh, is that alpha fold models have considerably more uh, hydrogen bonds uh, and, and presumably a more accurate hydrogen bonding network. So on the right here, we've got the NMR structure. Uh, and again, I've, I've really picked the wrong colors, but you've got roughly the right fold, but it's missing a lot of uh, hydrogen bonds. In fact, in that beta sheet, there are missing hydrogen bonds, which just seems very implausible. Whereas the alpha fold model has, has an extensive hydrogen bonding network, which means that the computed flexibility matches that of the chemical shifts much better. So I'd like to add to my summary, in terms of the future of NMR stretch determination, uh, we probably won't be using the simulated annealing algorithms we've been using for, for a while. Uh, instead, I think it probably makes more sense to you know, use an AI to abstain, obtain structures which are con consistent with experimental data, either by predicting them and comparing them to experimental data or using the experimental data uh, to, uh, as part of the AI. So if you'd like to uh, give answer a go, if you've got a structure in the PDB already, then you'll likely find the output on our web server, answer.com. Uh, alternatively, you can download the software from my GitHub account. Currently only works on Linux machines, um, and I can, I can help get that working. It's fairly straightforward. Um, alternatively, the, the software is available on NMR Box if you haven't got a Linux machine. Um, so thanks to my boss, Mike, to Mariam and Andrea for helping solve the NMR structures, to Adnan, our collaborator in, in Japan, and the BBSRC for funding the work. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Internet. Uh, any questions? <laughs>